Hi everyone and welcome back. Um, now I'm here with Rebecca Pittenger. She is a social worker in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at UCLA Health. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. All right, so we do have a couple of questions regarding your role as a social worker. So what does an oncology social worker do? I actually love this question. Um, oncology social workers do a lot. At UCLA, social work is housed in the care coordination department, and I think that's a great name for what we do. Our job is to make it easier for patients. So if you need help with transportation, financial resources, or just help talking about what's going on with you, um, we're here to do that. So what would, um, so all of those things, that's what you would talk about with patients and just mm -hmm. kind of walk them through yeah. all the other stuff that happens when you are diagnosed with a cancer. Correct. Right? There's a lot that happens outside of a doctor's office, and that's really where social work shines. Uh, normally, you'll have an evaluation with a social worker where we will talk really in depth with uh, family history, um, like I said, finances, and any other support needs that you might need. Gotcha. Um, and the conversations that you have with patients, is all of that confidential? Excellent question. In general, yes, what you tell your social worker is confidential. There are different rules in different states about what constitutes information that would need to be conveyed either to your medical team or to other professionals to protect safety. Um, that should be reviewed with you when you initially meet with a social worker. Um, other than that, almost everything that you tell your social worker is confidential. And is this only for the patients or is it for the patients and the family members? So that's a little bit more complicated. Gotcha. Um, normally we consider the patient our patient, but we are also working with the family. Um, so there can be conflicts in discussing things privately without the patient present. These are also things that should be discussed with you pretty thoroughly before you start. Gotcha. Okay, so when is the best time to meet with a social worker? I'm biased, but I think right away. Um, we can really help more when we develop a good relationship with our patients. Right. So the sooner you reach out to us, the more you get to know us, and the easier it is to reach out if something goes wrong and you need support. Okay. And how do you, does this person get in touch with a social worker? So it's different at different medical <clears throat> centers. Um, normally, your primary oncologist knows how to get in touch with the social worker on their team, and they can connect you. Uh, there's also usually a main number if you're looking at a website for any facility that you're going to. Okay. Um, for you, what are two recommendations that you have for new patients at the beginning of treatment? Awesome question as well. Um, the first thing I tell everybody is to get a binder, a notebook, or a Google Doc that you're going to share with your family because you're going to start getting a ton of information. Um, when you start to be involved in the medical system, you almost have to learn a new language. So every time you come into the doctors, you're going to get an overwhelming amount of info. If you can write all of that down and keep track of it in one place, it's going to make it easier to digest. You're only going to hear about 10% of what everyone's telling you on any given day. So if you write it all down, once you're out of the office and you have a moment of zen and you can sit calmly and read it through everything, it really helps you digest. Um, so that's one thing that I recommend to everybody. Um, if you're a little bit more tech savvy and you're comfortable with like a Google Doc or something like that, it also helps to share that with close family members mm -hmm. because then the patient doesn't feel like they have to keep reporting everything gotcha. to everyone. Yeah. So that would be number one. Number two is there are no stupid questions. I have a lot of patients that I meet with who say, I didn't want to ask the doctor X, Y, and Z because I felt like it might be a stupid question. Um, doesn't exist. We are here to help you because we do this every day. We're talking with the doctors, mm -hmm. we're talking about these types of cancers and the treatment. So this is normal for us, but we don't expect this to be normal for patients. We know that you're overwhelmed and that you're getting a lot of information. So slow us down, ask all the questions that you want. I like that advice where just slow everybody down because yes. I think being able, part of I think advocating for yourself is being able to just get into a, a group for yourself yeah and you know be able to do the treatment and and talk to people yeah. at your own pace and and we are the experts right mm -hmm. so sometimes people get a little intimidated but I tell patients if we start to get on the treadmill right and we're moving too fast for you 
just hit the stop button and we will slow it down. We know that we can get carried away and start shooting questions at you and information. Um, so just let us know what we can do to be helpful for you. Aside from writing things down, and I, I believe the doctors had also recommended having a caregiver Correct. along with you, is there any other recommendations that you would have for patients, especially during the overwhelming process of strategies that they could to help them? Yeah. The so this is a great thing that you can discuss with your social worker when you have your first meeting with them. Um, even just breathing exercises before you go in to meet with the physicians. Um, people can get that white coat syndrome where we all walk into your room and then suddenly you've forgotten everything right. that you wanted to say. Right. So one, you're going to write down those questions ahead of time. So you have your list. And then two, you're going to find a way to be calm and get through the appointment without letting that anxiety get too high because then it's it's going to mean a lot more to you and you're going to get a lot more out of it. Right. Um, one of the biggest questions that comes up at, at least the Leukemia Lymphoma Society is you know, the stuff about the finances, mm -hmm. um, where somebody even starts to be covered financially right. and can they afford treatment? What would you what would you do in those situations with those questions so here at UCLA we have financial counselors that review a lot of this with patients they'll go through your insurance see what's covered what might not be what you might have a high copay for for things like medications there's often financial supports through the drug companies um, some of those are based on financial need um, so sometimes we have patients bring in some financial documents so we can help them assess whether or not they would qualify for those programs. Um, LLS has a lot of programs <laughs> that we refer our patients to all the time to help with travel, co-pays. Um, there's a lot of resources out there and again we don't expect patients to be well versed in that. That's what your social worker is for. We review these all the time. We know how to access the resources. So if you think that's something that you might need, another great reason to reach out to social work. That's great. And I know Triage Cancer also has a really great mm -hmm. website to help sort through some of the finances yeah. and does like a step-by-step -step process for you. So check that website out as well. Um, I'm going to check in and see if there are any questions online from, from all of you out there. Okay. Um, the one question that we do have is, does every cancer treatment facility have a social worker? Okay, so this <clears throat> is a little difficult to answer. The answer is, for the most part, yes. They may not be assigned the way we are here at UCLA, so your social worker may not be housed in the clinic that you're going to, and you may have to go through an extra step or two to have access to them. Um, one really good thing to do is to call the center or the hospital that you're going to call the main operator number and ask for the social work department. Often there's an administrative assistant that has a listing of what social workers cover what services and they would be able to direct you appropriately. Okay, great. Any other tips for everyone out there before we... I mean, hard push to contact your social worker, very biased, but we would love to get to know you and help you, so come talk to us. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, and a special thanks also to Dr. Schiller and Dr. Young for sharing all of all of the knowledge that you all have. Thank you for having us. Yeah. This is great. All right. Well, that is all that we have. If anyone has any additional questions um, about treatment options, we do have two numbers that we wanted to make sure that you all had. So you can call the UCLA Cancer Hotline at 888-662-8252, and you can get referral to some top blood cancer specialists like Dr. Schiller and Dr. Young. The Leukemia Lymphoma Society also has a whole range of free resources available from financial assistance to clinical trial support throughout the cancer journey. Um, so if you would like more information, just call 800-955-4572. We have a lot of really great resources for newly diagnosed patients as well to help them uh, to help all of you who uh, might need strategic tips and um, questions to ask your, your social worker or your healthcare team. Uh, one other great resource that we do have is our peer-to-peer -peer connection program in which we can connect you with somebody who is a cancer survivor or even a caregiver 
who has had your diagnosis or treatment and has has that unique perspective of somebody who's already been there. But other than that, thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone.